Do you want to check out IT Pro TV but aren't ready to commit? We're making a few episodes from our most popular courses free for you to try here on YouTube so you can see what they're all about. Enjoy this episode and head over to itpro.tv when you're ready to see the full course. When we talk about delivering the data, how do the devices know how to get the data from the source to destination? Well, we're about to take a look at encapsulation. Find out more next. You're watching IT Pro TV. That's right, you've jumped back into, of course, Network Plus, and we are continuing on here. We are taking a look now at the idea of encapsulation. Now, Wes, when we start talking about this, this is where that theory that we've been talking about in previous episodes really does begin to actually have application because this is where we want to talk about the way that it actually works now, right? Absolutely. And you know what? I think we're going to build on an analogy that Ronnie brought in some episodes before when we talked about the OSI model, right? One of the things that we mentioned is that an end user, I'm sitting in front of my computer, I've got an application open, name your application. We like to say email clients because that really lines up kind of with our snail mail analogy, but we're going to use that. Remember that what we said, and if you haven't checked out those episodes, definitely check them out. Remember one of the things that we said is that when our data needs to make its way across the wire, Again, that's figurative for the network. doesn't have to be bounded media, but we need to send that information. That data isn't prepared for us in a way, right? It's still like writing, well, you mentioned media, right? We have to figure out what media are we using. In this case, it's going to be the application. But in a, the context of snail mail, what it typically means is that we're going to have some kind of paper, some kind of printed media that we're going to write on. But that by itself isn't going to get that information where it needs to go. And what we thought we would do here is we'd show you how the encapsulation process works and really how that relates to the things that we've already discussed, namely, like Ronnie mentioned, that OSI model. So let's go ahead and let's dive in. One of the easiest ways that I remember being taught this and how to remember this concept is because uh, is through a couple of pictures, all right? I want you to think about the onion, all right? And I also want you to think about, Ronnie helped me out with the, uh, the, the these Russian dolls, the nesting dolls, yeah. right? So what we want to think about is how does encapsulation work? Well, encapsulation really comes down to the fact that when we look at the OSI model, we're going to send our information, and what's going to happen is that each layer is going to rely on the services of a lower layer, right? So if we're going from the top to the bottom of the stack, like we're going to do here in this, then what that means is that the upper layer is going to perform whatever service it needs to perform on the data, and then it's going to rely on the layer below it to perform its services, and it doesn't need to be aware of it. Yeah, this is key for us because when we don't understand this concept, we start to wonder why do these layers really matter. Mm -hmm. layers, the layers really matter because we do not know what devices are actually going to be doing this, so that if we are sending it from a device like my computer, and now it's going through, let's say, a Cisco switch, well, that switch has to have some type of conformity or common familiarity uh, in terms of the layer to actually know how it's actually going to be addressed. So that's why it's actually important that we understand this idea of encapsulation of that service relying on the service underneath it, and it actually continues that way. So when we send outbound, that's what's going to happen. Yeah, absolutely. So, and we've already kind of mentioned this, but remember that the lower layers, they provide upper layer services, right? Now, it's also important to understand that you have your data. Now, we're going to change back and forth between calling our data a payload. You might even hear it called the payload. It's what we want to send. Before we even know how to get it there, or the network knows it, how to get it there, that's why it's the payload, right? And think about a payload. A payload has to be carried within a container, right? If you've ever seen the, the big 53-foot tractor trailers going down the highway, right? They have to know that, hey, I need this big trailer. I've got a payload that goes in it. I've got this driver advocate for, with me that's telling me where the destination is delivered. I need to use these paths, maybe the interstate most likely, and I need to take this direction. So that's kind of what you're going to hear. So don't let that confuse you. Let's go ahead. Oh, and those additional information, Ronnie, before I get ahead of myself, they're called headers, all right? If you hear that term... That's the additional information that's being provided by each service. So what do you say, Ronnie, we go ahead and we dive in? Sounds great. All right, so let's look at the communication as it compares to the OSI model like we've been talking. Real briefly, we're going to go from the top to the bottom. So we've got this uh, young lady on one side, this gentleman on the other side, and we need to send information. She's going to be the source. He's going to be the destination. 
Now we've got our OSI model and remember from top to bottom we've got those seven layers. Now when that data, she's ready to send that information, remember the application is what the application layer is really what starts us access into the network. And then what happens is it runs through the OSI model adding additional information down to the physical layer where we get our electrical characteristics. You know, when I first started about thought about this, mm -hmm. I remember getting a little bit confused because what I was thinking is that at each layer, we're going through a different device. Mm -hmm. But all this is really happening on that end user's computer, sure. actually getting that encapsulation like what Wes has talked about, adding in those layers as we go through, and it's only when it leaves that NIC, that network interface card at the data link layer, do we actually put it on the wire that then it's going to get transferred? Mm -hmm. So don't always think like I did at the beginning, like, oh, well, what device is it hitting when it gets to that, that uh, presentation layer? And then what's the next device when it gets to the session? No, at this point, everything is still on that computer, and it's not really uh, sent out yet. So that's part of that encapsulation as we begin. Yeah, I'm glad you said that, and I could have used that advice too. Hey, the operating system's taking care of a lot of this until it leaves right. the machine, and that's a good way to think about it. So this is the process, and we're going to go into it more, I, I, I promise you. This is the process of encapsulation. Now, once we get down to whatever the radiated energy for wireless, the electrical communications across bounded media, the gentleman on the right-hand side is going to receive that across the wire. And then what's going to happen is we're going to work now not from the top from the bottom, all right, it's from the bottom to the top. And again, processing all of that information to ensure that we have delivered it successfully to the right destination. And then that information is removed and the application uh, data, if you will, appears within that application of the end user. So that's kind of a high level overview of how encapsulation and decapsulation works and how it relates to the OSI model. Yeah, this is actually really important because we start to now understand and see that process that when we are sending data, we're going to be encapsulating the data. But when we receive the data as the destination, we're going to do a full decapsulation until it gets to that point where we now open it up with the application and now we can read that data. So that is a good process to remember that this occurs on those devices that are sending and receiving, but then portions of it will, I think we'll talk about this in, in this episode as well, portions of it will also happen on devices along the way too. Sure. So it's kind of neat. Yeah, very good, Ronnie. Decapsulation, we have to remember that we, we're working with both sides of the tracks, and you might hear that top to bottom, bottom to top. Remember, top to bottom is encapsulation. From bottom to top is going to be the decapsulation. So to build on a little, little more of that, just remember that we're reversing the process now, right? The lower layers are going to process the information at their layer, and then it's going to move up to the next layer. And that next layer's information is going to be processed, all right? And they go essentially back up the stack that way. Now, if we dive a little bit more into the encapsulation process, this young lady, again, like I said, she's going to send some information over to that gentleman. we got our OSI model here, so what happens? Well, we've got the data. The data basically hits the application layer that says, now we're going to start preparing that information to be put out on the wire. When the presentation does its syntax, does its encryption, does its compression. Ronnie mentioned things like uh, some of our graphical uh, media type formats, TIFF, GIF, if you will, and JPEG, PNG, all of those, right? It's going to basically process that information and put it in a format that can now be put on the wire. That is going to add that layer three or that layer six header. Remember that we're adding additional information. The data itself is still our payload. So remember we use those interchangeably. All right, next thing, we come down to the session layer. Now, remember, the session layer has been handed the information from layer six in a fully formatted way that now the session layer can perform its magic. Remember, we talked about what the session layer does. Uh, if we're talking connection-oriented service like transmission control protocol, it's going to build the session, it's going to monitor and maintain it, and then terminate the session after it's done. And that information is going to be established in that layer five header. Now, at this point, now we come down to the transport layer. All right, remember, as it comes down, we have a fully formatted piece of information from the session layer that can be now passed on to the, tr uh, the transport layer. And you're going to start to see this as we work our way down, right? Now we've determined, hey, we do want, let's say, TCP. We're going to bring down to it down to the networking layer, right? 
we've got our payload, but we don't have our driver advocate. We don't know exactly where we're supposed to be going, right? Well, that's where the routing information, that's where the IP address information is going to be placed on our envelope, if you right. will, right? Uh, you know, our destination and source, if you will. Then, once that is done, now that information is handed down to the data link layer. All right, and the data link layer adds its layer two header. This is where Ethernet, uh, typically in our local area networks, the most common layer two implementation, if you're talking on local networks, is gonna be something like Ethernet. All right, and then finally, once that is done, it's going, the frame, now we have a fully formatted frame, it's gonna be placed out on that physical media, and that's where we get those ones and zeros. Now, Ronnie, help me out with this. We've got some terminology. I use down here at the data link layer, I use this term frame, but that's not the only unit of data measurement that we have, right? Right, well, when it comes down to TCP IP, the mm -hmm. protocols that we're really talking about, even though we're using the OSI model, you'll see at the transport layer, it begins with the idea and that uh, particular term, uh, what was it called segment. here? Segment. That's right. Uh, is what we call it when you actually talk about data on that uh, transport layer. Then at the network layer, it's going to be packet. Then at the data link layer, you're going to hear the term frame. As you hear these terms, what they're saying is there's more information that's being added on. And ultimately, that frame is what will be translated into those bits to be put across whatever type of media that we want and sent across to the other side with that additional information. So when it comes to networking, the strange thing about this encapsulation is the network cares more about what's in these headers than it does about the data payload itself. Absolutely, it doesn't really care about yeah. the information. And I'm glad you helped us out with some of those data uh, units of measurement. We want you to know those for the exam, all right? So if you're not familiar with those, I'm gonna ask you to stop, rewind these, mark them down, make some um, you know, uh, flashcards if you need to. However, if you and I, if Ronnie and I are talking, you never know. A lot of times, if it's not on the ethernet layer or the data link layer, we're calling it a packet. Yep. And if it gets down into that layer two, we start calling them frames. So we're not gonna nickel and dime you on that, but for your training purposes, it does matter and it does matter for the exam and it is called out by the uh, network plus objective. So just be aware of what those measurements are. Now that was encapsulation. There's another way that you can look at this too, and it's kind of interesting in some kind of documentation when you're looking at packets where they hit the wire, you don't really see them in this stacked approach with all these headers. What you'll end up seeing is diagrammatically, you'll see them stretched across and broken down into blocks, if you will, and it kind of looks something like this. Same, same process, but you're looking at it a little bit different, right? Layer seven, we have our payload, layer six, layer five, and then layer four. Now, they also call out on the exam objectives, understanding that the layer four header is where we get that TCP UDP header. Remember at layer four, the transport layer, where and, and really of the OS, uh, not only the OSI model, also of the TCP IP model, it's where we're uh, saying, hey, what do we want connection oriented service or do we not want a connection oriented service? Then we have the layer three header. Now, I want you to remember layer three, what happens? Your logical IP addressing comes in, that's your IP header. And then last but not least, You've got the layer two header, and for us, the majority of the time, it's gonna be ethernet. There are other technologies that we'll discuss as we move through here, but primarily it's going to be a layer two header. Now I'm gonna call on my friend Ronnie here to help me out with this acronym, because this acronym in that ethernet header, there's also a metric, a unit of measurement that you gotta be aware of, and that's something called an MTU. Right, the MTU is our maximum transmission unit uh, itself. And this really describes the overall size and length of the entire encapsulated frame because once you get past a certain point, it's no longer really Ethernet anymore. So this is how they define that size. If it's going to be that Ethernet, Ethernet type of packet, it's going to be that size. And everybody actually talks about anywhere between 1,500 to about 1,518 bytes of data is what we actually end up seeing there. Most of the time, we'll probably just round it off to 1,500 but it's all about, hey, this is the maximum size that we're gonna transmit across an ethernet. That's about the closest that the network cares about your data. Like Ronnie said, it doesn't care about the data. It just knows if the size of the data is more than that 1500 uh, MTU, it's gonna discard it and you're gonna to have to resend the information. And that's about all the caretaking that ethernet's really gonna do when it comes to uh, transmission of your information. I kid, there is error detection uh, in there as well in flow control. Now that is encapsulation, all right? Rounding out our discussion, we have to talk about decapsulation. All right, remember this gentleman, he was going to receive that information. Well, 
ladies and gentlemen, it's really just a reverse of the process, right? We've got the bits that come off the wire, come off of radiated energy, right? Remember, the data link layer is going to define how it's encoded when it's being sent, so it's also going to define when it comes off of the wire how it's going to be decoded, right? And then it processes that header, remember, and then it moves up the stack. Is this the destination IP address? Well, this is the destination IP address of that gentleman. So his operating system continues to process it and it moves up into the transport layer, processes that information, and then finally sends it up from the session layer, if you will, to the presentation layer. Finally, back to the top where you get it. That's right. We get our data. The gentleman sees the data rendered in whatever network aware application he just happens to be using, again, for analogy purposes, we've been talking about email here. Yeah. Now, this is where, again, it got confusing when I first started learning about it as well. So if we're just sending directly from one computer to another, Wes's particular diagram is right. It's going to go through every single layer that we have. But a lot of times when we're sending the data, it's going across different network devices. And when we do that, this is where that encapsulation and decapsulation helps. So when we encapsulate data and it now hits that first device along the way, it has to begin that processing of those headers. What happens is it starts to actually process at layer two. Does it have my MAC address on it? Well, yes, it seems to have my MAC address on it. Then it looks at the next layer up on the network layer and it says, hey, is that my IP address? And it's not. Well, what happens then? That's when that device says, I need to send this back out is what happens. And then that device goes ahead and puts a new Ethernet frame header on it and then goes ahead and puts it back on the wire to be sent on to the next device. And then that next device starts the same process until it gets to the end. Once it gets to the end, then that destination address, it sees the MAC address. It sees its own IP address and says, yes, I'm finally home. I'm finally where I need to be. I'm at the destination MAC and source address. From that point on, all the processing to ensure that it can actually read everything happens at the end point. So that's why this is an important process for us to understand. And you actually see that if you have this understanding at the beginning, it'll help you later on as you begin to troubleshoot too. Most definitely. And if you want more of a visualization of what Ronnie's talking about, so let's say that this packet isn't that intermediate redistribution point, right? A router, most likely, right? Think of that as you've got a package, if you've ever watched it come, let's say, from overseas. All right. Remember, when we talk about a lot of our packet-based networks today, they don't generally take the, the closest ne necessary path. They can make it any way they want, right? But if he's not the destination IP address, how is the redistribution point, the router, going to see this? The information is going to work the same way we've just said, just like Ronnie explained it. It comes off the wire and it says, hey, is this my MAC address? Yeah, that, uh, that's the MAC address of the router. So let me process that information. And now let me inspect the layer three information. Is that my IP address? No, that's his IP address. Oh, well, we've got to look at the next hop to send it to. So guess what happens? It modifies the information at layer two, and guess what? Turns around, sends it back out to the wire until finally it reach, reaches that destination network. And that's kind of what Ronnie was explaining here. Remember that it also goes through this process through each of your redistribution points. Think of it as that airplane landing at whatever the major carrier facility is and they sort the mail and they say okay this has got to go to the next stop now we're going to put it back on a truck if you will and we're going to drive to the next stop we're going to process the information is my letter here or my package at the right destination no not yet so guess what we got to do bundle it put it back on the truck and go to the next stop until finally hopefully it ends up at my front door and i could take that package in and i can enjoy whatever it is that I've just bought, probably some Google device or something. But there you go, ladies and gentlemen, that's encapsulation. You notice we didn't mention decapsulation in the title, um, but you can't have one without the other, and it's part of normal communication process. That's right. All these are actually very important processes as we begin to understand how networking is coming together. But at least you now understand the process of how data does actually get sent out as well as arrives and how it, every device along the way processes a little bit more. Well, that will go ahead and wrap it up for this episode, but there is plenty more networking for us to actually talk about and for you to learn about, so you want to stay tuned for our very next episode. Thank you for watching us. Thank you for watching IT Pro TV.